Alrighty, welcome back to the uh, painting video for the nun. This is the uh, fourth video and final one where I focus on the base. Um, so it was just a zenithal prime, just like the nun herself. And uh, then I'm just working with uh, some wet in wet with a variety of colors. So when painting rocks, uh, ground, earth, uh, that sort of stuff, uh, you know, I think as a general rule, we have a tendency to, um, you know, think rocks are only ever gray and grass is only ever green and, and uh, that sort of mentality, which uh, uh, is is very inaccurate to, uh, to what life actually looks like um particularly rocks if you go and have a look at some rocks uh on the ground you'll find rarely are they are they gray they're, they're usually a lot of other colors as well uh, and so what i try to do with basing in general is bring a lot of uh, the colors uh, from the model into the base and I feel that works to to tie the two elements together. Um, it can be sometimes a little bit something I overuse, maybe. Um, you know, sometimes you want to provide a contrast between base and model. Um, but uh, in this particular instance, where the model is quite simple, uh, just wanted a, a relatively uh, simple base that tied in. Um, so wet in wet, and then using the the hair dryer there to just uh, quickly dry that. Again, one of my probably uh, best tips is is using the hair dryer. It's um, you know it's a it's a real time saver, particularly for painting individual single models. I mean, if you're painting a uh, a batch painting an army, it's probably not as necessary. Um, so here I've uh, I've grabbed out some contrast paints, and this is another you know fun and interesting uh, use for contrast paints. Is again just adding that uh, layer of uh, randomness, uncertain you know colors, and and I do that by uh, mixing a few different um, contrast paints on the model uh, at the same time. So uh, I think I've got uh, shyish sh purple and. Griff Charger Grey and uh, some snake bite leather there, um, and again this is you know this is uh, about building up layers. You know this isn't this isn't the end. Uh, it's it's the very beginning, and you know some of this stuff will be covered up, but it just it just creates you know the the random uh, irregular colors and textures and shapes that that life. Uh, has uh, that's very hard to replicate um, naturally with a brush. Uh, again, the hair dryer, what a magnificent piece of kit! Uh, this has been you know three minutes and already just just looking spectacular. Great stuff. Um, hair dryer costs about fifteen bucks, so rather than stealing your significant others. Uh, whether it's a uh, male, female, or otherwise, uh, just go and buy one from your local shops. It's a piece of cake to have one right beside the painting table, plugged in, ready to use whenever you need. Um, so here, the the next stage is uh, is adding some uh, really sharp, uh, high value highlights. And uh, if you've if you've watched uh, you know the scar video or um, uh, parts of the nun uh, early part of the nun video, you know this is this is a part of my process that um, is the way that I create uh, the contrast. I I over highlight and then I use glazes to bring it back down. And so for for this rock. Um, uh, I don't know what would you call it slab. Um, I'm I'm over contrasting, going all the way up to uh, that that ivory sort of colour, um, and then I'm going to use the airbrush uh, 
to smooth out uh, some of those relatively stark and harsh transitions. So um, I've used, uh, I think that's um, Miskatonic Grey there, which is a scale fantasy colour. And, uh, and using um, a little bit of ivory mixed in. Uh, again, just uh, working, uh, dry brushing, you know, whatever whatever I can do to, to speed up the process and, and utilize the texture that's already there. Um, and so this is, uh, this is just pure ivory, straight ivory from uh, Vallejo Model Color. And uh, again, concentrating a little bit more on some specific edges here and, uh, and adding some slightly more interesting um, textures and shapes. Uh, in a moment, I'll draw some, uh, some uneven lines and, um, you know, I think it's very easy to uh, look at some of the, the great works of miniature art and, uh, and, you know, look at the smoothness and, um, wonder how it's possible to achieve those sorts of results quickly and um, probably the short answer is it's not easy to achieve those results quickly <laughs> um, but it is it is possible to get similar results uh, much quicker than uh, than the, the many 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 layers that um, you know some of those uh, guys and girls opt for so um, this is a uh, yeah, very simple base, uh, very easy to uh, yeah, add, add a lot of color, a lot of interest, a lot of various textures and, um, and have it uh, not necessarily overwhelm the model, um, but also, you know, just add some, some interesting visual elements. I think that's a, that's a, you know, one of the most important things about specifically display painting, but miniature painting in general is making sure that your viewer is looking at uh, the, the key element, the focal points. For, for most miniatures, it's, it's uh, generally the upper face, shoulders, neck, around that area. There are exceptions to that rule, but um, you know, I think if you, if you keep the focus uh, on the face, uh, you know, that's, that's the thing that what most people, most viewers will connect with uh, and, and will will see first. So putting, uh, you know, a base that has higher contrast uh, will, will have the effect of maybe drawing the, the gaze of the viewer uh, away from your focal point. So, you know, one one very important thing um, to do is, is uh, constantly check in with uh, the model that you've painted and the base that you've painted. And make sure that the two uh, work together. Um, for, for for this particular piece, it's you know not probably not an essential part of uh, um, doing that because both the base and the model are, are quite simple. Um, but you know, on something a little bit more elaborate, uh, you know, it's uh, it's actually super fun to paint rocks and and uh, you know add those interesting layers and and uh, you know beautiful subtle colours, but um, if you if you spend too much time on the rocks and create too much contrast, it can actually um, harm the overall appearance of the model. So, I actually had that experience with the apocalypse piece that I did. Um, the uh, the base uh, was was too uh, higher value, and so it was was drawing focus away. So I used some airbrush glazes to bring that down. Speaking of airbrush glazes, it's exactly what I'm doing here. It's uh, Miskatonic Grey, the scale. Um, uh, fantasy color, really interesting uh, color, and, and here I'm using a um, a technique that's um, uh, pretty pretty easy to do, uh, pretty easy to overuse as well. So uh, with um, uh, airbrushes, there's there's two ways to achieve this effect. Um, the the what's happening is paint's actually spattering out of the brush. Uh, in little little uh, globules, which normally is the absolute opposite of what you want out of your airbrush. You want a smooth, fine mist. But here I'm actually using that to replicate some, some texture. Um, so the first way you can do that is by uh, 
uh, having your pressure very low and your paint very thick, um, which will uh, result in the paint not coming out of the brush uh, evenly, spattering. Um, I tend to dislike that method as I find, you know, that's creating uh, issues with your paint drying inside the, uh, the brush and, and sort of clogging up the brush. So the second way to do it, and you still do need to have a slightly more um, thick paint than you perhaps normally would with the airbrush, uh, but is to uh, pull the needle back without using air. Uh, and what will happen is that that will, will put some paint uh, at the front of the brush and then uh, and then push air down and that just causes a little spurt of that paint that was in front um, to spatter out so that's um, that's the the method I prefer to use P pull back and uh, and then let the paint collect at the, the reservoir and then uh, let the needle slip back forward and then uh, just push air on and that um, I'll do that spattering. So, and I did uh, probably 10, 15 uh, layers of that of that spattering effect um, in you know a matter of seconds. So, pretty cool. Um, it's also the way I do freckles on uh, on skin. Um, if you want some some uneven freckling, that's uh, a that's a cool way to do it. Uh, so I've gone back in here with a bit more dilute contrast. Uh, again, just those same two colours, Griff Charger and the uh, the Shaiish Purple, and then uh, much more dilute uh, Snakebite Leather, really blending those together, uh, you know, using little little spattering motions there to, um, you know, again, add more interest, more texture to uh, what is a flat surface. Um... So, uh, one of the things that I have a tendency to do is uh, is make shit up as I go along, and uh, and this base was uh, was no exception. Um, I sort of looked at, at what was happening uh, with the rocks and with the uh, the ground, and decided that uh, I wanted to change the the look of the uh, the dirt, and uh, that I'd pull out some pigments. Um, haven't haven't done a lot of work with pigments. Uh, one of the guys who I do uh, paint with on occasion, Gavin Clark, um, does some really incredible stuff with pigments on bases. Really, uh, you know, subtle, subtle uh, color changes and shifts, and you know, this really interesting dusty uh, effect, which um, which I love. Um, and I've never actually been able to replicate that, and I think it's probably. Uh, due to a level of impatience that I have, but um, so my my usage of pigments tends to be a little bit more rudimentary, uh, but I do find that you know that they can they can provide a a nice uh, uh, contrast from uh, the slightly you know satin finish of paints and uh, you know the, the painting that you've probably done. Uh, to the very dry and dusty and matte finish of the uh, of the pigments. Uh, so there's a couple of ways you can apply them. You can actually apply them dry, uh, and then uh, using a brush, uh, a soft, uh, you know, relatively hard bristled brush, apply them dry, and then use a a pigment fixer to uh, to put them in place. Or in some cases, uh, if you weren't using gaming models, you could just leave the pigments on there dry and uh, generally they don't tend to uh, come off the base much. Uh, the way I tend to use them is uh, is applying them uh, to a wet surface. Uh, I feel like it just gives me a little bit more control and it also creates um, some really nice uh, effects with the water when the water dries you get these tide rings and tide marks. So. Um, so the first step is uh, is getting all the pigments out and then adding some just straight water to the uh, the base there, um, and then uh, dipping in the pigment, adding the pigment to the base. And where it's wet, we'll actually um, 
dry it's, it's going to dry significantly different to this you know this but this is uh, just an easy way to manipulate the uh, the pigment on there without uh, necessarily getting dusty pigment everywhere um, so the two pigments I've used there are both uh, a ready uh, brown which again I think ties in with the nuns uh, non-metallic metal ish bronzy ready color um, and so uh, again just just thinking about tying the base together I got out a green and, a, and an orangey color to use but uh, the the reason I didn't opt for those was uh, again just just didn't didn't feel like the model needed uh, you know a more powerful base I felt like something quite simple would be uh, would be better uh, so once you've applied your pigments uh, roughly and, and probably in some cases uh, you've got a little bit too many pigment clumps uh, then it's just a matter of getting the uh, the, the wet brush uh, I should say probably moist brush because if you use a wet brush you'll you'll flood the base and the pigments will um, spread everywhere which isn't necessarily ideal um, although it can be something you can you can use um, a more of a moist brush you can uh, you can move pigments around uh, you know you can you can uh, remove pigments that are uh, there's too many of them. You can, uh, if you change your mind about a pigment area, you can, uh, you know, remove that completely just with some water. Um, and you also get this interesting effect of uh, of being able to uh, bring two pigment colors sort of together. And um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's actually quite a lot of fun playing with playing with pigments. Um, I actually said to myself when I finished this. Yeah, I've really got to really got to do that some more and uh, use them a bit more. So my next trip down to the uh, local hobby store, Irresistible Force, I'll probably procure myself some some new pigments, some interesting colours. Uh, I think uh, uh, Hera Models uh, does a range of fl fluoro pigments, which are cool, um, and uh, and obviously those uh, those pigments there, are Dark Star and uh, Mig pigments which are both uh, very very good uh, quality pigments that I quite like um, don't have very intense saturated color range though so and here we have the uh, probably section I should cut out but shan't be doing uh, which is me putting the pigments away and then uh, using the hair dryer to dry the base so Again, this is this is you know something that makes that um, usage of pigments this process uh, much quicker. You know, normally you'd have to wait for that dry to to, to evaporate and dry, but here I'm uh, using the hair dryer, and uh, it's going to take all of about ten to fifteen seconds to to remove the majority of that water and start to get that dry, dusty look that pigments end up with so yeah re relatively uh, you know, relatively quick process this has been 20 minutes um, on this base and you know some some quick shifts in uh, airbrush to pigments to brush and um, I think the fluidity and, and, and willingness to just uh, work with what you've done and and, uh, and keep keep mucking around until you've reach something you're happy with is uh, is the the key to doing this so once again bringing the the brush back and just re-adding a little bit more of the uh, uh, color of the stone um, much more precise than uh, than previously done uh, just want, want to retain the uh, the work that I've done and um, not you know lose the cool pigments uh, important to be careful here the pigments haven't been sealed down so uh, you know, using a, a moist brush can actually pull the pigments around a bit. Um, uh, so I'm sort of putting in uh, some again miskatonic grey here, just uh, again dots, uh, little little uh, edge highlights, and uh, and focusing on areas where there isn't much pigment, just to reinforce the uh, 
the change between the uh, the pigment and the stonework. Uh, so as we reach the conclusion of this video, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, just uh, obviously, if you have any feedback for these uh, videos, always happy to take it on board. Uh, the, the usual social media channels I can be found on. Um, this is an is a you know a new uh, process for me. I, I don't find the uh, uh, the camera inhibiting my work too much. So I do plan on on doing a fair bit of filming of, of most of the works that I paint. Um, but if you have any suggestions for for other uh, videos or um, you know, processes that you'd like to see, feel free to send them my way. Uh, as always, at uh, you know the the last stage of any section that I paint, I uh, I've gone in here and used the old matte varnish from uh, AK Interactive Ultra Matte, and uh, once again that just harmonises. It also has the effect of sealing. You can use a pigment fixer. Um, on pigments, but you can also use a matte varnish as well. It's not uh, not necessary to use the pigment fixer and then matte varnish. The varnish has the same effect. And there is uh, the finished base. Uh, took yeah 20 minutes, um, and I'll add a few little touches to that. Big Dino out. <laughs>